We're here with Raj Sivakumar, um, who is head of the Travel Technology and Strategy Unit at WNS, a global business process management company. And um, Peter Fader, who is a Wharton marketing professor and most recently co-director of the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. And we're also joined by Mike Nemeth, who is head of the insurance practice in North America for WNS. So welcome, everyone. Great to be here. Good morning. Good morning. So people are talking a lot about big data and customer analytics. What is customer analytics, and why should companies pay attention to that? So on one hand, customer analytics has been around forever. Uh, from the time that marketing as we know it today was born, let's think about the 1950s or so, when we started realizing that customers are different from each other and that there's different ways that we can meet their wants and needs and, and anticipate what it is that they might want next and get smarter about uh, how we'll deliver it. So we started collecting a lot of data. Started with demographics, sprinkled in a little bit of behavior, started asking questions about attitudes, started getting physiological measurements as well, then let, let's talk, mix in a little bit of social uh, too. So a, a lot of it is uh, both being smart about the kinds of data that we should be collecting in order to make better decisions, uh, but then the analytics part is getting beyond the data or more specifically below the data. It's, it's telling stories about the true underlying unobservable processes that are driving that data and driving business success. So if you think about analytics, one of the ways that we like to break it down is into three broad buckets. We have descriptive analytics, we have predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. The names are reasonably self-explanatory, but it's interesting to see where the, the, the boundaries and the synergies are between them. So with descriptive analytics, that's just all about the data. So let's collect data, let's, let's come up with, with suitable summaries of it, let's, let's do some data visualization, let's do some data science to really take the raw data and best frame what's going on. Then when we get to predictive analytics, the word predictive is a little bit misleading. It's not only about prediction, but it is this idea of drawing insights that aren't directly observable in the data. That's where we want to pull out people's true underlying propensities, which is going to help us make predictions, and it's going to help us make better decisions. But predictive analytics, I mean, that's really quite literally the heart of the analytics, is, is the models that we build, the stories that we tell to really understand what's going on. And then we layer on top the prescriptive part. So now that we know what's really going on, and now we can project what's going to happen next, what do we do about it? So how are we going to optimize? If we have a pile of money to spend, how are we going to allocate it across different kinds of activities or different customer segments or different geographic areas? So it's all about this, this notion of, of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. And that, of course, leads to the decision making, uh, which is what my colleagues here can talk with much more expertise about. So what are some of the data sources companies are using in customer analytics? So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of generic data sources, uh, some of which are becoming super hot, some of which are tried and true. So it all starts with demographics. Not to suggest that that's necessarily the best, but it certainly is the oldest and the most common. And there's a lot of companies that even when they find better data sources, they care so much about just simple, observable characteristics of the customer. So it's going to be things like age and gender and geography, uh, moving a little bit uh, into um, media habits, what kind of car you own, tell me more about the characteristics of the zip code that you live in. So demographics will kind of spread itself out and will sometimes get into things, like I said, media habits, so that wouldn't be a demographic, it would really be more of a behavior, uh, but it's still something that we often use to label people. Uh, and then as we move from kind of uh, who people are, we move to what is it they're thinking about? So that's when we're going to move into attitudes. So things like your wants and needs, your frustrations. Uh, one of the real common attitudinal metrics that we uh, focus on today would be net promoter score. So, you know, would you recommend uh, this particular service to someone else? That's just one of, of, of a myriad different uh, attitudinal metrics. Uh, at the other end, there'll be different kinds of behavioral metrics. So we might say, doesn't matter uh, what people look like, doesn't matter what they say, it's all about what they do. And so that's going to be uh, the transactions that people make. It's going to be uh, their interactions with a website. 
It's going to be their interactions with each other. It's going to be their responses to inbound and outbound marketing activities. Uh, and then we can th that gives us a, a segue to the next one, which would be social. So we care a lot about who someone is connected with. So uh, how many people do you have in your social graph? How many of those links are, are inbound, people looking at you versus outbound, you looking at other people? Um, uh, what, what's the, uh, 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 how central are you to the overall social network? So there's many different kinds of social uh, activities. And then a real big one that, that's really taking off today would be different kinds of physiological measures. So if we think about uh, a, 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 the whole a wearables revolution, so let's measure uh, heart rate. Let's uh, let let's track people's eyes. Uh, let's 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 look at, at their at their at their movements, not just where they're going, but how fast they're moving, and so on. So so there's a range of different kinds of metrics. And the real beauty of analytics isn't just collecting a lot of data, but it's figuring out ways to do it in a really synergistic manner that we can draw insights from these different kinds of metrics uh, collectively that we couldn't draw from uh, any one of these types by itself. So what are some of the common mistakes that companies make when they collect and use big data, as well as when they deploy analytics tools? So what should they be doing? Well, I think uh, the first mistake that people make is, uh, in the insurance industry uh, in particular, I should say, is that they assume that the way they have the data organized and, and uh, the data they're storing is going to be useful in an analytics uh, project. And, and it isn't always. One of the first barriers is, uh, how can I reorganize information from the various places uh, that I have connections to internal and external? How can I organize that data? Uh, and how can I transform the information to make it usable uh, in, in an analytics project? So uh, it, it comes as a surprise sometimes uh, to people. They uh, tend to hire a bunch of uh, uh, expert analytics uh, uh, people. Uh, they buy tools, uh, they put them all in a room and they say, uh, we have a lot of data, which uh, insurance companies have massive amounts of data, and they say, tell us some insights. Uh, and it's just really not that simple. The very first step is, what data are we going to use? Uh, where are we going to create a new data store that's used specifically for analytics purposes? How do we manage that data, replicate that data over time, uh, is, is really the first challenge that people tend to, tend to face. And in the, in the travel industry, uh, just to add to what Mike said, with the, with the data collection becoming so much cheaper, storing data becoming so much cheaper, unfortunately, the emphasis on data collection, okay, has overshadowed the emphasis on analytics. Okay, and so, so a lot of, lot of companies, a lot of, lot of people collect data to what purpose? And the key is to be able to ask the right question to get to the right answer. Okay, you know, you got the, the, asking the right question is so much more important. Okay, and because if you ask the wrong question with the technology that we have, we can really quickly get to the wrong answer. So the emphasis on analytics, the emphasis on interpreting the data, the emphasis on realizing that it's all about trade-offs is so much more important in the current environment. I surely agree. And, and I think about the old days. Again, I'm, I'm a real historian of, of marketing and business. There's so much that we can learn. When we didn't have all of this data, when there really was more focus on decision making than on data collection and data management, uh, and uh, companies were pretty good at taking just a limited amount of data and squeezing as much value out of it as possible. Unfortunately, today, a lot of companies are saying, well, we have all of this data that we didn't have 40 years ago, so therefore, whatever we knew back then is irrelevant. So I think it's important to understand, to, to think before collecting data, to think about what kind of data you need in order to address the specific questions and hypotheses that you have in mind, rather than this idea of if we build it that is a data warehouse, amazing things are going to happen. So we're all on the same page about that. Well, some companies, particularly ones in the banking and insurance industries, sit on a lot of data, as you guys mentioned but they don't really mine it to great effect. Can you give more details and information about the barriers that stop companies from uh, mining the data to great effect? Sure, uh, I, I think it begins with the fact that the data that's been traditionally collected in the insurance industry is not about the customer. 
we, we have elementary information, like Peter mentioned earlier, uh, gender, age, location, things of that nature. But really, most of the data that is being sat upon by insurance companies uh, is information about the risk not about the customer. So it's about the house, it's about the car, it's about the business, uh, as opposed to about the customer. And we can intuit a certain amount of customer information uh, from information about the risk, but most of it is not about the customer. So collecting information specific to the customer is a relatively new thing in the insurance industry. Uh, and so uh, these doors are suddenly wide open. And like Peter mentioned just a moment ago, uh, all of a sudden we have this influx of information that insurance companies have not had a lot of experience with. And so they don't really know how to interpret the meaning of some of that information, uh, how to combine it with information they do have experience with uh, to come up with good analytic uh, results. And, and, and I think one of the keys to making that work is to add domain expertise to the analytics project teams. Uh, and this is sometimes overlooked, unfortunately. Uh, we hire analysts. Uh, we buy tools. Uh, we have data. We think those are the three components to, to produce these fantastic results. And they forget about the domain expertise that needs to go into the mix. And Raj hit it right on the nail uh, when he said, uh, and, and I, I think we have more questions <laughs> about this, so I won't go too deeply into it uh, at the moment. But analytics is all about asking the right questions. And the people who know what the right questions are, are the domain experts. I do want to say everything that Mike just said, take out the word insurance and financial yeah, services yeah. and plug in pretty much any other yeah. industry and the same applies. <laughs> in fact, in many ways, insurance it might be a step ahead of, of many other sectors because traditionally they have looked at, at, say, risks differently for different kinds of customers as opposed to a lot of other sectors that have looked at the customer in some kind of singular way. There is the customer. Uh, but, but indeed, the idea that our data collection has been much more focused on the products that we develop and the activities that we do to develop and serve those products as opposed to those previously faceless, nameless customers out there that were creating the demand for them, uh, that is a change. And, and I like to believe that a lot of the activities that I'm doing and that happen uh, at, at, say, in academia in general, uh, are trying to get companies to kind of wake up and realize that it's not just a matter of collecting more data about your products, it's about changing the kind of data, the kinds of questions that you're asking in a very transformational way. And uh, just to add to what Peter said and Mike said, and unfortunately, like Peter exactly referred to the uh, the issues that Mike talked about, he cannot take ownership just in the insurance industry. It's industry agnostic. And perhaps what kind of rears it head in the travel industry, and particularly with the airlines, is the issue of trade-offs. Okay, let me give you a very simple example, right? So the marketing department would like to ensure that the customer of the highest tier gets the preference in terms of seat assignment and travel. Whereas the revenue management department would like to make sure that every single passenger pays the highest price. So this trade-off between what you charge a customer versus you allocate a, allocate a high value customer who may not be paying a high value, sorry, high value on that flight, becomes a classic trade-off. So you know the companies that understand the trade-offs better or can leverages the data to understand the trade-offs better is going to be well served. So what's next for customer analytics? So right now, it's been so much about the data, and I think we've, we've made it very clear, and I hope that, that people resonate with the ideas that it's not just a matter of collecting more data. So let's go back to the basic rubric of the descriptive, the predictive, and the prescriptive. Uh, there's been so much attention these days on the descriptive part, which is let's collect lots of data, let's <clears throat> make lots of pretty pictures, let's do a lot of what we call data science. The problem is, when we talk about data science, there's been too much emphasis on the data and not enough emphasis on the science. And so I think that the next generation, as we start seeing that there's limits, first of all, not only to how much data we can collect, but the quality of data that we collect, is going to start saying, let's not collect anymore. Let's think more carefully about that data. Let's understand the processes that are driving in the first place, and let's get smarter about the, the ways that we can layer on top different kinds of, of, of prescriptive or, or optimal elements. So I think we're gonna see, I don't wanna say a shift, I'm not saying we're moving away from data by any means, but a broadening of our horizons, a little bit more of the science to, to balance out the focus that we've had on data so far. 